Hi, everyone. Welcome to Grace Chapel. Wherever you are, at home, in the car, in the office, watching or listening, we are so glad you're choosing to spend time with us today. If this is your first time with us, we are thrilled that you're here. Please feel free to say hello by sending us a text or leaving us a note in the chat room. Today, we're in a series called Fast Forward, discovering the way of giving up something or making space in our life to gain something new or better as we make our journey towards Easter and spring. I'm someone who loves progress, getting things done. Honestly, I really love my to-do list. It keeps growing every day. Now, creating a stop doing list is another challenge. And yet doing something meaningful and worthwhile requires intentionally deciding to stop doing something else, to make room for something new, to be present to God. This is what we're exploring this Lent season. We're going to listen to a sermon from Pastor John about putting on the practice of prayer as we take on another fast this week. I find when I'm busy and in a hurry, moving from one thing to another, it's hard for me to really pray. Pausing and turning something off and making room seems impossible. I'm eager and ready to become more persistent in prayer and aware of God's presence and seeing more of His activity in my life. Now, before we get started, I want to share one of the things that I'm really excited about this season. It's the connections and stories we've been hearing of people who have made their way into our online groups. We do want to help everyone find community by getting connected. So let us know that you're here to learn and experience God with us. If you're interested in learning more about getting involved in a group, you can text the word group. Or I invite you to email me directly at stephenn at grace.org. As hard as this season has been, has also removed some of the limits of commuting and childcare needs. We've learned new flexibility so we can engage in community. So thank you for stepping out in faith and for taking a risk. Now let's prepare our hearts and invite God through this song and prayer and invite God to speak and challenge us with the hope of discovering something new.
I don't know about you, but I come from a family that is very susceptible to marketing and salesmanship. If you can make a good sales pitch to my family, it doesn't matter if you have a really good product or not, we'll probably buy it. When I was really young, I went on a vacation on a tour bus full of people throughout this beautiful island in Korea called Jeju-do. And one of the stops was this farm. And once we arrived there, we all sit down cramped into this tiny hut. And the person who works on the farm starts telling us the history of the place we're in. And near the end of the speech, out of nowhere, this guy takes out some oranges, literally just like this, not exactly this, but just like this. And he begins to explain that these oranges are magical. He says, these oranges are better for your body than any other orange in the world. And then he starts naming random things that these oranges do for our body. But then he said one thing that made me pause. He goes, these oranges can cure diabetes. I'm like, what? And I look over at my family and to no one's surprise, I can see they're all locked into the presentation because my dad is a diabetic. The tour guide salesman then takes out a box of orange juices that were made from these oranges. And he says, a drink a day of this will make your diabetes go away. The cost? The low cost of $250. <laughs> as soon as the sale pitch was over, my family all huddled around. They're like, we need this, we need this. My little middle school brain at that time was trying to process this. I'm thinking, I know I'm only in middle school, but shouldn't this be a bigger deal if this was true? Like, shouldn't there be news stations here and not tour buses? And why do these oranges look like the ones from Market Basket? Now, I never thought those thoughts out loud to my parents because you just don't do that to Asian parents. But I thought those things very strongly in my heart. And for those of you wondering if our family went through with that purchase or not, uh, let's just say I don't really enjoy drinking orange juice anymore. <laughs> now, your family might not be susceptible to marketing schemes like our family, but we all live in a world where, especially if you're connected to the internet, like, we're all constantly being told something and sold something 24-7. You know, let's be honest with each other. We all have something lying around in our house, wondering why we bought this thing, like that pull-up bar that's been sitting idly in your basement for the past six years. But we're not just being sold products anymore. We're being sold on what I'm going to describe today as the three Ps. People, products, and philosophies. You know, especially because of the internet, we live in a world of constant noise, telling us how we can live better lives if we listen to this person's opinion, or buy this product, or do that because we live sad, inadequate, unfulfilling lives. And even if we know it's not true, the more noise we allow to enter into our lives, the more susceptible we are to believe it. No, this is not a message about how people, products, and philosophies are bad. In fact, the internet is filled with things that are healthy and helpful, like our We Are Grace Instagram page. Shout out. But the consequence of allowing a lot of outside noise to constantly enter into our lives, sometimes even the good ones, is that we end up drowning out the voice of God. And that voice, that voice is the one that needs to be clearest in our hearts and in our minds. Because he's the one who knows the best for us and loves us the most. If you joined us last week, you know that our Lent series for this year is called Fast Forward. And each week we are inviting you to join us in a fast, to give something up so that we can have something even better. So last week, we invited you to fast from a food or drink together as a church. This week's fast is going to be fasting from outside noises. And I'm going to explain exactly what that means and how we're going to do that at the end of our message today. But as we quiet some of the outside noises this week, I invite you to fill that void with something even better, the voice of God through prayer. But as we're going to read in today's passage, the invitation isn't for us to just simply pray, but to pray with shameless audacity. Let's see what Jesus means by that in our passage today. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, let me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked. And my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, Yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. 
So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So Jesus tells us this story right after the disciples ask him to teach them to pray. So Jesus teaches them the Lord's Prayer, which teaches them what to pray. But immediately afterwards, he tells them, the sto- tells them this story about how they ought to be praying. I'm going to try my best to contextualize the story a little bit here. So imagine your friend comes over late at night and says, hey, uh, you have anything to eat? And you go, no, but I bet you my other friend does. Let's go over to his place and ask. So you walk over to your friend's house at midnight. His lights are off and he's clearly sleeping. Not only that, you also know that he lives in a studio apartment with his wife and two young kids, all sleeping in the same bed in the same room. You think about it for a second, and then you start banging on the door, yelling at him to wake up. You could start to hear his kids cry in the background because they've woken up from all the noise. Your friend eventually stumbles over his way to the door, eyes half open, and goes, John, is everything okay? And you say, yeah, of course. Um, But hey, do you have any leftover pizza? My friend came over and I've run out of food. What do you think he's going to say? Those of us who have young children at home, if someone came banging on your door at midnight and woke up your kids so that he could ask for food to give to his friend, you might never talk to that person again. The homeowner in the store responds in the way that we expect him to respond. He says, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. But eventually he actually gives in and gets up to help his friend despite how outrageous his request was. But he didn't do it because he was compelled by friendship. Jesus says, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So the reason he gets up to help is because of how bold the request was. He's he's seemingly impressed by the nerve that his friend had to come to even ask him for bread at that hour. In that culture, it would have been rude to not be hospitable. So the friend is essentially shaming him into meeting his request. It's kind of like something that happened when I was in grad school. Uh, A few weeks before finals week, uh, someone in the middle of our lecture raised his hand and asked, Professor, how would you feel about canceling our finals this year? And our professor was completely taken aback, like thinking to himself, how dare you ask that in front of the class? And I was worried that the professor was just going to fail all of us for even entertaining that thought. But after a long pause, he goes, let me think about it. And no lie, our professor ended up canceling our final for that year. Shout out to that guy who asked. Now, I do not suggest that any of you try that in your schools, but I think the professor said yes because he was impressed by the shameless audacity of the request. So, what is shameless audacity? The word in the original language for shameless audacity means lack of sensitivity to what is proper, carelessness about the good opinion of others, ignoring of convention. Imagine asking someone how their prayer life is going and they say, "Uh, it's going great. Uh, I'm lacking sensitivity to what is proper and I'm being careless about the opinion of others and I'm ignoring all conventions of prayer. You probably think, I really need to pray for that person. But the prayers that have moved me the most are prayers from children because they have no gauge for what is proper in prayer. I used to be a children's pastor and then there were times we would invite children to come up in front of the church to pray and I would never know what they were going to say. Sometimes some of them would come up and they'd just say stuff like, "Um, I'm mad at my mom. She didn't let me watch Frozen last night. And as their pastor, I'm like, no, you can't say that. Or they'd come up and just say, God, Ben's being mean to me and it's hurting my feelings. Why are you letting that happen? 
And in my mind, you can't pray those prayers in front of people. But that's actually exactly the kind of prayer that God loves. God doesn't want us to pray with contrived words and manufactured emotions. He wants honest words and authentic emotions. He doesn't want us to hide. He desires raw, bold, audacious, unconventional prayers because those are from the heart. But a lot of us think that God desires proper prayers over shameless prayers. We think that God cares more about the act of praying than the posture of our prayers. But to pray with shameless audacity is to pray not to fulfill a religious duty, but to satisfy a desire to be met and heard by God. I love how A.W. Tozer describes prayer. He says, prayer is not just a conversation. It is an encounter with God. It's the awe of praising his glory, the intimacy of finding his grace, and the struggle of asking God for his help. Prayer is more than just a conversation. It's more than just a religious duty to speak with God. We pray not because we have to pray. We pray because we get to meet God in our prayers. It's an encounter with a God who desires to hear our struggles, our joys, our concerns about how we didn't get to watch Frozen last night. Our disappointment, our, our, our hurt and our pain, that's what God wants to hear. He wants to hear those raw and, authentic, uh, raw and authentic prayers, but he doesn't just want to hear our prayers. Jesus, near the end of our story, says this. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Um, as a new dad, I've learned firsthand how hard it is to say no when my daughter wants something. She's just one year old. She's just a one year old, and whenever she wants crackers, she comes up to me and says, Kaka? Which is Korean for crackers and snacks. And my wife always tells me not to give it to her because she's already had too much or it's not healthy for her. But I have such a hard time saying no. And I think my daughter knows that because she always waits. For the moment when mom isn't in the room, she crawls over to me and says, Gaka, how can I say no to that? In our passage today, God says even evil people know how to give gifts to their children. So how much more do you think I, your heavenly father, father would give to my children who ask with shameless audacity? But the thing that God promises when we pray with shameless audacity is not always the very thing that we pray for. Oftentimes, it, it does mean that. But the thing that God promises to give his children who ask with boldness and shameless audacity is the Holy Spirit. He says, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? There are probably some of us who have prayed shameless, audacious prayers and have been heard that God hasn't done what we had prayed for. But when we're so focused on looking at what has or hasn't changed externally, we don't see what God might be doing internally. Because what God promises here is that if you pray with shameless audacity, I'll give you my presence, my nearness. And then we begin to cultivate more of an awareness of God in our lives. I think it's embodied best in this quote uh, from Kierkegaard. He says, when we pray, it isn't to change God, but it is to change him who prays. And so when we pray with that kind of audacity, maybe that's what God is doing in us. So uh, the reason I'm so passionate about having a shameless, audacious prayer life is because the Korean church is built on that kind of prayer life. And I've seen how it changed people. If you grew up in the church, some of your earliest memories of church might be Sunday school or VBSs. Mine was going to church with my parents at five in the morning for early morning prayer services. By 5.30 in the morning, the pews would be filled with first-generation Korean immigrants that were desperate to meet God in prayer. The prayer time was always the last part of the service. And there were almost like phases to the prayer time. 
If you've been to a prayer gathering before, the first phase is like your typical prayer time. The lights are still on, the pastor might throw out a few prayer topics, you know, here and there, and people might be praying. But in almost every Korean church I know, there's a phase two. And that begins when the lights turn off and a music track starts playing in the background that for some reason sounds literally exactly the same no matter what Korean church you go to. I don't get it, it doesn't make sense. But that's when prayer really began. You can hear people get out of their chairs and, and, and get on their knees. Some people immediately are weeping. Some people are singing. Some people are screaming, Chuya, which means Jesus in, in Korean. Just over and over again. But they're all crying out to God and laying their souls bare to him. They leave literally everything in prayer. They don't care who is next to them. They don't mince any words or hide their emotions. They're not worried about being proper towards God. There's no time limit to their prayers. It often goes until they've laid their entire heart out to God. In fact, when I was a youth pastor at a Korean church, we used to have Friday night youth group events, the same time the parents had their own service and prayer time. And I was allowed to go home once all the kids went home. And I had always dreamed of going home when our program ended. But every single Friday night, I would be at church close to midnight with at least one student whose mom was always praying with all of her heart. When I was younger, I didn't really understand why they prayed that way. But now that I'm older, I'm beginning to understand why they prayed that way and why they continue to pray that way today. Oftentimes, um, they're praying for the pain of leaving everything they know behind so that their kids might have a better chance of success. They're crying out for the loss of self because their lives are consumed by their small businesses. They can't even afford to take a day off work. For them, a bold prayer life is necessary because they can't depend on anyone else. No one is there to help them to adjust to life in America. They only have Jesus. Which is why it particularly breaks my heart to see the rise of hate crimes towards elderly Asian Americans in the recent year. I've seen a lot of those stories pop up in recent weeks. And even though it doesn't always hit the major news stations, um, it, it hurts my heart because I think about how unwelcome and alone they must feel. But it made me realize why these first-generation Korean immigrants put all of their trust in Jesus. It's because they have nothing and no one else. When, when they pray, they're not praying to fulfill some religious duty. They pray because they want to satisfy a desire to be met by the God who cares for them. And I wonder if we pray in that way. Pray in an expectancy to be heard and met by God. For me, even though I'm Korean, there's so many times I pray just to check something off my to-do Christian list. I'm not expecting for God to meet me in my prayers, especially when I'm overwhelmed, actually. Now, oftentimes you would think you pray more when you're overwhelmed, but when I'm overwhelmed, I, I tend to pray less and, and, and go to God less. And for a lot of us, we feel really overwhelmed right now. We're in a season where, where it's been a really difficult year. And I wonder if we've turned more away from prayer in this season. But God is inviting us to lay our hearts bare to him in prayer. To pray with shameless audacity with all the things that are going on in our hearts. And for some of us who might feel like we are having trouble hearing God in prayer these days, it might not be because you're not praying with shameless audacity. Maybe it's because there are so many other voices in your life right now. That's why this week as a church, we're going to be fasting from outside voices. And we're going to be doing that by fasting from social media together as a church. And I don't know about you, but for me, I feel like this is going to give me permission to do something that I had always wanted to do anyways. Most days from the moment I wake up, I pick up my phone. And I don't put it down until I'm asleep. And that's exhausting because all day, the three P's that I mentioned earlier, people, products, and philosophies, are constantly trying to tell me something and sell me something. It might not be magical oranges that they're trying to sell me, but now I'm constantly being sold illusions of success and happiness. 
How if I had this product or this lifestyle or this job, how successful and happy my life would be? When these outside voices and noises constantly bombard our minds, it drowns out the voice of God. You know how there's always this like awkward dance on Zoom when multiple people try talking at the same time? There's a pause and then someone starts talking, but then someone else unmutes themselves and start talking at the same time. And then they talk over each other for a second. And then they both mute themselves. And then one person unmutes them. And then the other person, and there's always this like awkward dance that happens. And even on Zoom, when multiple voices are trying to talk at the same time, you can't hear one voice properly. So why do we pretend that we can do that with our relationship with God? Uh, For some of us who feel like we have trouble hearing from God in our prayers, maybe it isn't that we haven't been praying with our hearts. Maybe it's that the outside noises were equally as loud as God's voice in our life. So in order for us to hear the one voice of God more clearly in our prayers this week, let's turn down some of the other noises in our life. And that's why we invite you to fast from social media this week, or if you don't have social media, a a social media equivalent uh, together as a church. And I promise this is going to be helpful for you. I remember uh, a couple of years ago, there's a time when I didn't have like uh, internet access or I didn't have social media for two months. And I've never heard God's voice more clearly during that time because every day that I woke up, all I heard was God's voice in my life. He was constantly telling me, hey, John, I love you. You're, you're wonderfully and fearfully made. That's the only voice I heard every single day. And so if you fast from social media with, uh, with us this week, I know that it's going to help us hear the voice of God more clearly. As we close our time for today, I want to leave us with a few practical suggestions on how to pray with shameless audacity this week. And then we're going to spend some time actually praying together as a church. The first thing I suggest that we do is choose a time to pray every day. It's very simple, but I think really effective. Maybe write it down or make a note of it in your schedule. The reason the Korean church loves praying in the morning is because in the Bible it says Jesus would often pray early in the morning. For me, I've decided that's what I'm going to do this week because, you know, by the time it's night with, you know, my work and with having a a one-year-old at home, I just don't have the capacity to really be be thinking and pouring my heart out. So for me, I'm going to wake up early this, this week to pray. The second thing is find a place where you can be alone. That isn't to say we can't pray shameless, audacious prayers in community, but in in scripture, the disciples would often find Jesus praying alone. He would be by himself. And sometimes, you know, he would tell his disciples to wait for him, but he would go off into a place that he was by himself. And I wonder if he did that so that he could quiet some of the noises around him. So find a place where you can be alone. And, And lastly, pray persistently and honestly. Don't pray to fulfill a religious duty. Pray to fulfill a desire to be met by God. Pray with honesty. Pray with audacity. Pray with boldness with the things that are on our hearts. In our story today, we learned about a friend who did just that. He prayed with persistence and boldness. Or he asked with persistence and and, and, and from his heart. So we ask you to do the same. So three things. Choose a time to pray every day. Find a place where you can be alone and pray persistently and honestly. Now, uh, we're going to give you some time now to pray shameless, audacious prayers. If you were in the church building right now, I would ask to turn off the lights and turn on a bumping Korean early morning prayer music soundtrack. But since we're not in the church, why don't you take a moment right now to posture yourself to encounter God in prayer. Maybe that means putting down our phones. Maybe that means getting on your knees in your living room. Maybe that means screaming chuya in front of your TV. But when we pray shameless, audacious prayers, there is no proper way to pray. The only thing he desires is our raw, authentic hearts. So I'm going to throw this question up here uh, in a second, and I'm going to give us a moment to think about it, And then I'm going to explain exactly what we're going to do. So the question I want you to think about, and this is what we're going to be praying about in the next moment, is this. What is on your heart? That's it. 
What is on your heart? I'm going to give us just a few seconds to think about this. So as I was writing the sermon and praying and thinking about the sermon, I actually decided to call my parents and ask them, hey, why do Korean people pray with such shameless audacity? And when I asked my dad, he said, it's because Koreans identify with the characters in the Bible who pray out of pain. People like Hezekiah and Hannah who prayed out of a place from pain. And then I asked my mom, and she said something that summed up my message today better than I could have. She said, well, for Koreans, they've been praying from a place of pain for decades. The pain of the Korean War that separated millions of children from the parents, the pain of the years of poverty that followed, then the pain of a difficult immigrant life. She says, how could you not pray with weeping and honesty when you have so much pain? And then she says to me, for Koreans, desperateness is what defines our prayer life. If you pray with desperateness, don't you think that God will listen? So what's on your heart? Is it loneliness? Is it celebration? Is the church on your heart? Is it the nation? Is it purposelessness? Is it pain? Whatever is on your heart, God wants to meet you, encounter you, and transform you. Jesus teaches us that when we pray with shameless audacity, he will give you as much as you need. His arms are open wide. So whatever it is on your heart, if you pray with desperateness, don't you think that our good God will listen? I'm going to open up this time now to, to pray whatever is on our heart, whatever popped up when I asked you that question. And a little music is going to pray, and then I'm going to be here with us a little bit. And eventually, we're going to go into a song of worship. But even during the song of worship, if you're praying, I, I, I encourage us to continue to pray. Because I believe that God wants to encounter each and every one of us today. So let's go to, let's go to him boldly with all of our hearts. Let's bear our souls to him. Let's pray. We pray these prayers with expecting hearts. We ask that you would meet us and encounter us and transform us. That as we pray these prayers with shameless audacity, as we lay our hearts bare before you, that you would meet us. Amen.
removing distractions and noise, slowing down the pace of life so we have capacity to pay attention to our Creator takes conscious effort and intentional focus. Pastor John invites us to turn off some of the noise and distractions by fasting from social media to listen to God. So here's our challenge. Take a break from logging onto Twitter or checking your Instagram feed or posting something on your Facebook story. Pause and reflect on what God could do in those few moments. Let's have the courage to say out loud to God some things that we've held on for a long time. Anything related to our families, relationships, work life, emotional and physical well-being. Let's take some risk to name our deepest struggles and concerns, giving voice to God who longs to hear our desperate, real, and honest prayers. Let's invite God to do something extraordinary in us and through us with a confidence that doesn't quit. Now, if there's any way we can partner with you on your faith journey, let us know. In addition to joining us each week for our services, I want to invite you to go to our resource page at grace.org slash Lent. You'll find some resources for following along with us, as well as information about our short-term groups that are being launched for Lent. You can also text us the word group to find more information. You can jump into a group that will be starting, or you can grab some friends and launch a group. We will be providing a study to track along with our teaching series starting this week until Easter. And here are some good words. May our God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.